Hi students, I'm Yu Han, and I've made this tutorial question with my classmate Bing Rei in 2020. And I'm here to go through how do you actually approach these questions. So in the first question is on transition state analogs. And we are told that neuron mediated or NA catalyzes this reaction. And you are told to propose the acid catalyzed mechanism for this reaction. So the question says that this is a hydrolysis reaction, but let's simplify the question. What is actually happening here? What we notice is that this is actually a nucleophilic substitution. But this group, OR, is substituted with this OH, and this OH is our nucleophile. Right? So now the question is, is this SN1 or SN2? So this reaction is actually an SN1 reaction because the carbon cation formed in the first step is actually resonance stabilized. Okay, let me show you how is this resonance stabilized. So let me just draw a simplified carbon cation of, for this compound. So this is a carbon cation for this compound. What we notice is that this is this electron, the electrons in oxygen can actually delocalize into this carbon cation inside to produce this compound, this resonance structure. So as you can see, the carbon cation is resonance stabilized. Therefore, this whole mechanism goes through SN1 mechanism. Okay, now let's draw draw out our mechanism. So we know this is that. Uh, this OR group is actually a poor living group. Why? Because OR minus is actually a very poor base. So we need to make it into a better living group. So how do we do that? We do that by actually protonating it with an acid, like H plus. And this will produce a good living group. It actually wants to leave. Next step, you get a living group to be. So the next step, you notice that this is actually a carbon a very electrophilic carbon group. So this is really readily attacked by a nucleophile, in this case water, to form this compound. And because this is an enzyme, the reaction is actually stereospecific. Okay, so now this is basically this compound over here. All it ha has to do is actually just lose a proton and we will have our final product. Another way to look at this problem is that you notice that this group here, this is actually an acetal. Well, this group here is an hemiacetal. As we recall in our normal organic lesson, is that we actually know how to form a hemiacetal, an acetal from a hemiacetal. So essentially, this whole mechanism is the reverse of 
the acetal formation from a hemi acetal. For the third part, we are asked to suggest why this also tamifil or tamiflu is a good inhibitor for neuraminidase, which is the enzyme that was that catalyzed our initial reaction that was written here just now. Okay, so let's look at tamiflu. I mean the first thing that we notice is that tamiflu has a similar structure to our reactant, which is the sialic acid. Yes, the sialic acid. But the more important thing is that essentially tamiflu has a similar structure to our transition state. Look at this part of the, the molecule. This carbon is sp2 hybridized and it is, it is planar. If you look at our, our transition state, this carbon, which corresponds to this carbon over here, is also sp2 hybridized and it's also planar. Or to be clearer, it's becoming more sp2 hybridized and it's becoming more planar. So to understand how having a similar structure to the transition state makes this a very good inhibitor, let us recall our, our enzyme catalysis theory. So essentially, right, the enzyme, it lowers the energy level, the energy of the transition state. So in the normal reaction, the substrate has a very high activation energy and to produce a product. So the enzyme, it stabilizes the transition state to form through this E transition state complex and lowers the, and therefore it lowers the activation energy by this amount to produce the product and therefore the whole reaction is catalyzed. So essentially what we are saying is that the enzyme it helps the substrate reach its unstable trans 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 transition state and helps to stabilize the transition state. So if we have a compound that is that has a similar structure as the transition state, what happens is that like the tra transition state, it will also bind to the to the enzyme and become stabilized. However, unlike the transition state, the inhibitor here is not unstable. So therefore, it has no tendency to actually return to dissociate to form back the enzyme and the inhibitor. So basically the enzyme is stuck here. And the enzyme would not be available to actually catalyze this reaction. And therefore, the, the reaction, the enzyme is effectively inhibited. So similarly here, Tamiflu flu has a similar structure as the transition state. Therefore, Tamiflu can bind very strongly to the enzyme and the enzyme, neuraminidase, could no longer catalyze a reaction. And therefore, the whole enzyme is inhibited. Okay, so for part D, we are told to propose mechanisms in order to form also Tamivir from this reactant. So in the first step, this reactant reacts with sodium hydroxide to produce this product, this intermediate. So how do we do this? Is that let's analyze the question first. So essentially, we want to form this C double bond C, which is between this carbon and this carbon. So as we, as we know, this carbon is electrophilic, but this carbon is not neutrophilic. So the the first step is to make this carbon neutrophilic. So since this is a, this is a basic medium. This carbon can actually be converted into an enolate by the base. To form this, this intermediate. Let's erase this big arrow first. Now we know that this side is now nucleophilic and this side is electrophilic. This set helps to set up our entire reaction. 
So there's a nucleophilic attack by this carbon on this carbon. And then we will produce this compound. Now we, we need to remove this oxygen atom. Okay, so this oxygen atom is a polyene group. So the first step is to simply protonate it. With water. To produce. So now we, we need to do an elimination reaction. However, we can't do an E2 elimination because OH here is a poor living group. So we need to essentially we need to do set up the reaction such that OH can readily leave. So what we do is that we remove this proton using a hydroxide anion to form an anode. Now this will be the rate determining step for the elimination. And notice that the rate determining step does not involve the living group. So OH does not have to be a good living group in, in this case. So now this it, 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 this inolate functional group is actually very reactive. So you will readily kick out an OH minus anion to produce our final product. And this is the whole mechanism. Okay, so for the second half of the reaction, we are supposed to form this from this. And the reactants are sodium hydroxide and I2 equals and H plus. So it, this is quite obvious that this is a, your iodo form reaction. So in iodo form reaction, I it is an electrophile. And so we need to make this carbon nucleophilic. And similarly, like the previous reaction, to make this nucleophilic, we will just remove a proton to form the inolate. Now Now this inolate can readily react with this electrophile to, f to form a mono-substituted group, like so. So what we notice here is that this hydrogen is actually it's actually more base acidic than this hydrogen. So what this means, right, is that the OH minus can remove another proton to form another inolate. This could react with another iodine and become substituted a second time. So 
Oh, this hydrogen, you know, is even more acidic than this hydrogen. And could again be deprotonated by another OH minus. produce another enolate. Like so. Now this enolate can react with another iodine. Produce this compound, this intermediate. So what we notice is that this is actually a good living group. So the, for the last step, the last OH minus group will attack this electrophilic carbon or carbon and what we have is a nucleophilic acyl substitution Inductively stabilized carbon ion. Okay, don't have much space. Okay, so even though these two are the same, right? But what actually happens is that the carbon ion. It removes a hydrogen. To form a more stable carbon. To, to form a more stable halogen alkane. And this thing forms. This carboxylate anion forms. So the last step we add acid. So in the last step, this thing will be protonated by an acid to form the final product that we want. Which is also tamivir. Okay, now we can move on to question 2, where we are looking at iron hydrogenase and the role frustrated Lewis pairs play in its catalysis. So the first question asks, why are phosphines good Lewis bases and borines good Lewis acids? So phosphines are good Lewis bases because it has a lone pair. And this electron pair could be donated to a Lewis acid. While borine is a good Lewis acid because borine has only six electrons around it. But in order to have an octet, a stable octet configuration, it needs eight electrons. So this borine, this boron atom is actually electron deficient. Therefore, it makes this makes it a good Lewis acid. So why is this a very good Lewis acid, a very good Lewis base, and why is this a very good Lewis acid? Basically, in the phosphine, there's three big alkyl groups that inductively donate electron density into this phosphine which helps to enhance the electron density around the, the phosphorus, making it a better Lewis base. Of a boron, all these fluorine atoms inductively withdraw electron density from the boron, making this way more electron efficient and a way better Lewis acid. As such, this, two, this is a good Lewis base and this is a good Lewis acid. So the next part of the, in part B, we are told that these two reactants, even though this is a good Lewis acid, this is a good Lewis base, and this is a good Lewis acid, they do not react. But why is this so? Basically, these big groups 
they sterically hinder a bond, uh, sterically hinder bond formation between the phosphorus and the boron. Therefore, they do not react. And therefore, we call this to frustrated Lewis pairs. Because they are frustrated that they are unable to react. So, the frustrated Lewis pairs are useful because they are very useful in catalysis. So, basically, they are able to rip apart small molecules very easily. So for instance, if you have a hydrogen atom, hydrogen molecule between the P and the P and B, this could readily happen to produce to produce this compound and this compound. This has a positive charge and this has a negative charge. And so these are the answers for part C. Okay, so for part D, we are told that the react the products from part C actually helps to reduce amines to amines. So we are basically abbreviating this big group with AR and this big group as CY for simplicity's sake. So the first thing, this thing is a hydride donor. So you donate this hydride to the electrophilic carbon here to produce this product. And now, this is a H plus donor, i.e., this is an acid. So, this thing takes an H plus from this compound to produce our final amine. Okay, so we can finally turn our attention to iron hydrogenase. So, this is the main reacting moiety in iron hydrogenase. So, we are first asked why this OH and this iron 2 center form a frustrated Lewis pair. So, basically, this is a Lewis base because it has, because it has, lone, it has lone pairs. And this is a Lewis acid. So they form a frustrated Lewis pair because this OH and this iron 2 are actually bonded to the same end of one C and they are pointing away from each other. As such, this, this distance is physically very long and actually prevents a very strong covalent bond from forming between this OH and this iron 2 center. So therefore, they form a frustrated Lewis pair. So next we'll ask why does why is this iron 2 center in a low spin state? So it's actually because of these two carbon monoxide ligands. They are, they are bonded to this iron 2 plus ion. This bonding is actually very strong because of this effect called pi back bonding. I'm not going to go into detail about pi back bonding, but you can search this up online. So basic, because the carbon monoxide forms a very strong covalent bond, with the iron 2 plus ligand, the iron 2 plus center, the energy gap after the d orbital split due to, due to the co coordination of all this of all these different groups, this energy this energy gap becomes very large. As such, the electrons prefer to fill up the bottom few orbitals first and pair up rather than be elevated to the higher energy the higher energy orbital. Therefore, this iron 2 plus ion is in a low spin state. The next part asks us to draw the orbital splitting diagram for the iron 2 plus ion. So, it is basically this diagram. So, we label the axis and we fill in the electrons. So, this iron 2 plus center needs to be in a low spin state in order to have this two empty d orbitals. This allows this, op this alcohol group to actually want to form a covalent bond with the iron 2 bar center. So for the last part, we are, we are asked to explain why does this OH group need to be deprotonated in order for a reaction to occur.
in order for it to form a, frust a strong frust frustrated Lewis pair with the ion plus center. That's because the OH group here is actually a very weak base. So by removing a hydrogen, we form a phenoxide. We form a phenoxide anion. And this is a much stronger base than OH. And as such, the tendency for this O- to want to form a covalent bond with this ion 2 plus increases. As such, they will form a very strong frustrated Lewis pair. Okay, so let's move on to part I. In part I, we are told that the H2, H2 gas and OH2 undergo a ligand exchange to produce this, where the H2 forms a covalent bond with ion 2. So first, the question is, which orbital in H2 actually forms a covalent bond with ion 2? So to do this, let's draw a ammo diagram for H2. So H2 only involves two, one atom, and that's hydrogen. And hydrogen only has one orbital of interest, and that is the 1s orbital. And each has only one electron. So these orbitals will overlap to form two different, or, two different orbitals. One is a, a sigma bonding orbital, and the other one is a sigma anti-bonding orbital. And then we'll just fill out the rest of the electrons. And we realize that the field orbital, like the highest occupied molecular orbital, the HOMO, is this orbital, and the lowest occupied molecular orbital is the one sigma star orbital. So in this case, ion 2 plus here is a Lewis acid. That means it's electron deficient. That means it accepts electrons. So basically, that means, right, that the orbital that donates electrons to the ion 2 center is essentially this orbital, the 1 sigma orbital. So that's the answer for part I. For part J, we are told that after the ion 2 plus coordinates with the hydrogen, what happens is that the O minus here accepts one hydrogen, leaving a hydride anion attached to the ion 2 plus center. So now this hydride anion will react with this will react with this compound. Will donate a hydride will donate a hydride to this compound. So you donate the hydride here because this is basically a electrophilic imine group. And this carbon is highly electrophilic. And for this hydrogen, we donate the hydride to this carbon to produce this compound. And this will be the mesonal H for MPTH. And that's the answer for part J. So now we have reached the final part of our second question. So in the final part, we are told that some scientists would like to make a similar catalyst to iron hydrogenase. But instead of an iron 2 center, they wish to use a manganese something center. And we are asked to find the oxidation state of this. So in order to do so, this iron 2 center and this manganese something center, they need to have the same number of electrons. In other words, these two must be isoelectronic. This iron 2 center has four electrons in this 3D structure. And as such, this manganese something center also needs four electrons in this 3D structure. We know that the, in the elemental state of manganese, manganese has 5 electrons in the 3D structure. As such, to form this manganese something center, the elemental manganese will need to lose 1 electron. As such, this manganese has the oxidation state of plus 1. And this is the answer 
for the final part of this question. And that's it. This is the last question. Thank you for listening.